Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and I'm flying solo today because they're all doing other things. And I decided I want to go and do something on the War of the Roses. I haven't done a podcast like this in a while. So with me, I have Daniel Burton, who's a historian who specialises in the War of the Roses, uh, amongst other things as well, which she underlined to me earlier, as well as the life of Anthony Woodville. And this is what her first book is actually on, Anthony Woodville's Sophisticate or Schema, which is all about the War of the... Well, partially about the War of the Roses. Hi, Danielle. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, great to be here. Really excited because I haven't done one of these in a while. Let's talk about your book because... I guess when we talk about the Woodvilles, in, especially in popular history, we tend to talk about them in snippets. And we don't tend to talk about Anthony Woodville himself. I mean, I, very, I know very little about him. So I'm really interested in knowing more about who he was. So before we jump into who he is, who are, who, who are the Woodvilles? Yeah, so I suppose we kind of hear him from the Woodvilles in terms of, um, you know, his Anthony's sister Elizabeth marries Edward the Fourth, and that's really the main way that people know who the, the Woodvilles are. That they've at least heard of his sister Elizabeth Woodville. Um, so really, she kicked everything off really by um, marrying uh, King Edward the Fourth, which was seen to be quite a you know a big thing because uh, the Woodvilles were actually a lower gentry family. So obviously, somebody from that kind of background marrying the king. Um, in those days, you know, really, uh, you know, a big thing not to do, really. So that's kind of where they, they come from, really, that their, their main lands are in Northamptonshire, but they do own um, lands in other counties, but that's kind of where they are, really, that um, they were known on a local level, really. They had a lot of local, you know, county jobs, those sorts of things, you know, um, that would have made them important in the counties that they that they owned land, but not necessarily, you know, on the, the you know, the countrywide scale. So they weren't, you know, nobodies, but, you know, compared to obviously, you know, the the royal family and all of the nobility, they're, they're not quite the people that you'd expect to be marrying into royalty, um, really. Um, but actually, I think where I start my book, with is um with Anthony's uh, grandfather who was called Richard Woodville um because he's the one that kind of starts getting the Woodville name a little bit higher up the scale really so he comes involved in the Hundred Years War with quite like a lot of um people at that time um so he ends up actually um working his way through that and promoting himself to um a squire of the body to Henry V um, and that's kind of slowly where you start to see um, the Woodvilles are involved in a few more things. And then obviously Anthony's father, who was also called Richard Woodville, as they all like to name themselves after each other in these in this period. Um, so within, you know, you know, he's the one that kind of gets more involved again um, because he's actually, you know, the family started to find favour, like I said, with the royalty at that point. But um, it's Richard Woodville that people mainly know is the, really is the first one who did um, because he was actually employed in the household of the Duke of Bedford who was the regent of France when um, Henry VI was a very young child at that point and um, so that's kind of where you start to see them emerging a little bit a little bit more. Out of curiosity slightly off topic well well not really because you kind of brought it up a little bit was this idea that Elizabeth marries above her and Edward obviously marries beneath him Obviously, we have all seen the TV program. Uh, what is it? The uh, the White Queen. That's it. The White Queen. Yeah. Now, out of curiosity, with that, obviously, you see it because she charms him with magic. We all know that's bullshit, right? First of all, because yeah, th- that is how you're going to basically portray women, and that's how a lower class woman married a higher class man. Do we actually know how they met? Actually, a lot of um, that kind of courtship is very much um, 
quite you know kept quite quiet because obviously at that point Edward is being um there's marriage negotiations that the Earl of Warwick is the head of um to hopefully marry him to possibly a French princess so that's quite at a, an advanced stage so like I said there's lots of um smoke and mirrors really in that in that sense that we don't really know when and where and and whatnot it's just that how many months after their marriage Edward kind of goes hey by the way I'm married to Elizabeth Woodville that's so it's one of those cases of um you know it's not really brought up straight away so we're never going to know 100% the details sadly so that's why it was invented to do with the magic and just kind of smoke and mirror yeah it also comes from the fact that um much later down the line, uh, the Earl of Warwick is trying to get rid of um, the Woodville camp around Edward the Force because he's he's the guy that he's called the King Maker. He's the guy who helped Edward become king, and he doesn't like the fact that there's other people muscling in on his space. Really, um, so later on, he actually invents um, a a witchcraft case against Chiquetta Woodville, Anthony and Elizabeth's mother. Um, and it actually does go to court and he brings these, the, you know, what's used as evidence is these um, little uh, magic figures that mysteriously appeared and nobody really knew where from. And he says that they were used as like voodoo dolls, I suppose is what we probably describe them as, um, this, to suggest that that was how Elizabeth and, and uh, Edward, you know, fell in love and got married. Right, so let's come back to Anthony. Obviously, uh, me going off on a tangent is expected. But let's talk about his family life because we are obviously going to jump into things like fighting chivalry politics and all that because you cannot talk about this story or about that without those mm-hmm. things. But what does it tell us about him as a person if we look at him and his family life? Um, well, I suppose in terms of the fact that we all know that the, the Woodvilles were quite a large family. Um, so obviously that brings implications, like I've already slightly alluded to, that that means that they are quite a large group now forming around King Edward IV that would not necessarily have possibly got so high up the chain as they would have done without you know, Elizabeth and Edward's marriage. Um, so really, actually, they were quite, considering that there's, quite a large family they're actually quite a close-knit family as well I think you can we kind of sometimes fall into the trap that people in the past don't necessarily have the emotions that we have now and you kind of think oh it was all polit- you know family was all about politics at that time which of course it you know for people of a certain status it was um so um you know following Elizabeth's marriage, it's very much been a case of, oh, she's been accused of trying to promote her family through marriage. Um, But actually, Anthony Woodville himself was actually one of the ones who had actually married prior to Elizabeth's own marriage to Edward IV. So actually, he's not part of that particular bit. He'd found the person that he wanted to marry before, just before um, they got married. We think, again, not really sure at this time, you know, there's lots of dates that don't necessarily get recorded. Um, So we think that um, Anthony Wardville married his first wife, Elizabeth Scales, in the run-up to um, the Battle of Towton in 1461. Um, So we kind of, in that respect, I think he's very much, what you know, know, in these days, family is pretty much everything really and its status and its um, relationships that matter and things like that but actually he's also trying to carve a way for himself as well just like any you know anybody today would probably understand that really um but actually even though there is that closeness I think very much he was not necessarily wanting to be involved in the politics and all of the you know all of that that perhaps other members of his family have become much more well known for. So I think in that respect, I, in my personal opinion, I kind of imagine him as right. Yeah, I'm a guy. I love my family, and he did. He was completely family orientated, but I kind of feel like he would be very good at um, constructive criticism as to what they might be doing wrong. Kind of, you know, that father uncle figure of of the family really which is what he he ended up being later on um but for me I think the most um important thing to 
note in terms of relationships with his family is he lost a lot of family members through quite difficult circumstances. So, for example, his father, Richard, and his brother, John, they were executed without trial after the Battle of Edgecote. Um, so we can only imagine what that would have done to the family as a whole. Um, but in a way, Anthony never really forgot that because he actually ended up um, giving land to the College of Eton, um, which was actually a personal uh, connection to his brother John um, that he gave it in, in honour of his, his brother John. So I think um, that shows that even though he's staying out of things, that he's still doing personal things for his, his family. Um, so there is a sense of loyalty there, even though he does want to carve a different life for himself personally. I'm just trying to put this family tree in order in my head here. So he is the second son. Um, no, Anto, Anthony's the first son. Um, there's a bit of argument because they know that they, they lost one one son called Lewis and there's not actually, because of them being a lower gentry family, there's not really um, very good records as to birth order particularly. So he's definitely the first surviving son because there's arguments as to whether or not this Lewis was actually before or after uh, Anthony in birth order. So he's definitely the first son, but there's arguments as to whether or not him or Elizabeth was the first, um, you know, the firstborn. Because again, like I said, there's um, um, at this point that unless you are probably, you know, high nobility or royalty, it's not very good at keeping um, dates and things of people's births. So they're actually not, too sure when Anthony was born, possibly somewhere between 1440 and 1441. So either him or, my point is, so yeah. that was going to be my next question, was Elizabeth older or younger? But if we stick around the same age range, I guess. Yeah, they, the they are, there, there's probably no more than about, you know, anywhere between three, four, five years. So not not too much of a an age difference between him and Elizabeth. Okay, so coming back to Anthony, we we have this really nice overview of what he's he's like, a family orientated man, like the uncle figure that you said he is going to become. They're now at this point in the Yorkist camp after his father and his brother both get executed, and now he ends up again <laughs> riding to war, and he ends up in Northumbria. How does that come about? Yeah, so um, the Woodvilles become Yorkist after the Battle of Towton in, in 1461, which is the battle that made Edward IV king. So at that point, the family decides, you know, Edward's now king, that's stick to being Yorkist. So what happens then is, um, obviously, even though the Lancashians are defeated, you have particularly Mar the Queen Margaret of Anjou, who's the wife of Henry VI, particularly wanting to fight not necessarily for her husband, because I think she probably understands that he's a bit of a contentious figure as he's, you know, was king from a baby and has quite a lot of mental illnesses. It's not, even if it might be for, in the name of Henry that she's fighting, she's fighting for her son, who's obviously going to be the heir. So she carries on fighting, really, even if necessarily, like I said, Henry VI isn't necessarily capable of doing that. She's the one who organises armies to come back and, and fight for the Lancastrians. So what happened is that um, she was able to get a lot of support from France because she was, a, you know, originally from France herself um, and also Scotland because they, like, they do kind of have a sort of alliance with France and also they like causing trouble in England. <laughs> um, so she gets support that way. And um, obviously Northumberland's fairly close to the Scottish border. Um, so that's where these forces kind of land and, you know, accumulate in, in this, you know, in the Lancashire name. So Edward, you know, he's only been a king for a year and a bit. So he has to go out and fight for this because he realises how, at this point, how brittle his reign is because he's obviously not been king for very long and obviously you still have got this, this Lancastrian threat. Um, so he rides out of London and in, in late 1462 with um, an army. And um, it's been described as possibly the biggest group of um, noble peers at that time. You know, so it's quite a substantial number that he's, he's marching up towards Northumberland with. So, and Anthony is actually one of those um, men in this force. So it's actually the first time 
since the family turned Yorkist that he has got a chance to prove his newfound loyalty and, you know, say, look, I can I can do this, really. Um, so that all seems to be going swimmingly until um, Edward actually catches measles and he has to stay in Durham. Um, so the Earl of Warwick has to be then the guy in charge of all of this force and he takes them um, to, to Northumberland. But obviously, unfortunately, the time of year, they decide that they're going to besiege all of these castles in Northumberland in November, December, January. So there was a lot of really bad winter weather, which, you know, hindered that, really. And obviously, with a sudden change of leadership as well, there was quite a few things not working necessarily to to the Yorkist advantage. Um, but Anthony was actually at um, the Siege of Annick, which was the last of the uh, Northumberland castles to fall um, with these sieges. Um, so actually, that was probably the most brutal because of it being the longest. So there was this stories of, you know, morale being really low because they're having to sit there all the time, you know, besieging this castle in, you know, very cold, wintry conditions. Um, not necessarily the greatest thing to be doing. So, and again, like I said, as it was the last one to fall, that a lot of there was quite a large group of Scotsmen actually came to relieve the siege, and they actually managed to rescue quite a number out of uh, of Lancashians from from inside the the castle. So that's kind of what brought the siege to an end, really, rather than any um, fierce fighting necessarily. But actually, even though it kind of did go badly wrong and was kind of criticised in terms of not really planning about weather or um, leadership necessarily. Um, for Anthony himself, it had been in that opportunity that he needed to prove himself to the, the Yorkist regime, really. Um, and not long after, he actually was awarded the, um, the Order of the Garter, which is something that you have to be, um, you have to have a recommendation from somebody to be able to to gain um, you know the the order of the garter, and that's by um, either you know proving yourself militarily as well as um, proving that you have good enough family connections, as well. So far, we've seen that he, well, he's a good soldier. He gets a prestigious award, but apparently, he also how would you say this? He also fights in tournaments. Yes, is he good at it? Yes, actually. So um, it turns out that it's a skill that the Woodville men kind of all share, actually. And so his father, Richard, and two of his brothers, John and Edward, are all very good jousting um, champions, really. Um, And Anthony is part of that. And I suppose he's actually the most famous of his brothers in terms of, um, you know, tournaments, really. Um. But his his most famous one was actually the Smithfield Tournament in London. Um, And that was part of um, the idea of trying to gain better connections and alliances with Burgundy. So he actually fought that with a guy also called Antoine. I'll say Antoine to not confuse him with Anthony. (laughs) Um, Who was um, known as the Bastard of Burgundy. He was actually the illegitimate son of Philip, the Duke of Burgundy. Um, so this whole tournament had been organised as part of attempts to gain this alliance. So um, it all starts off with uh, Margaret of York, who is Edward IV's youngest sister, being betrothed to Philip the Duke of Burgundy's heir. Um, and this is all tied in with that, a way of finding diplomatic ways of you know cementing this alliance so you know what better way in the age of chivalry to have a tournament as well with um because Antoine was meant to be a very famous Burgundian tournament uh champion as well so it's basically pitting off um I suppose if you came up with two really famous footballers today it's the equivalent of of that basically a football off yes yes you know, like somebody's dream team kind of idea. <laughs> the same same sort of idea, really, I think. Because um, really, tournaments, I, I kind of see them as like the foot, big football matches of, of their day, really, in terms of, you know, the amount of people that would have been going to see these spectacles. So his most famous one is this one that he fought at Smithfield. 
And you think, great, you know, you can immediately see how big and how grand that this is going to be is because they are allowed to, you know, it's written in the rules that they're allowed to bring spare horses if, you know, in case there's any accidents or whatever. Um, And Anthony alone bought nine horses with him and they're all completely caparisoned up. So all dressed in spectacular things. Um, And, you know, and they all had a, each of the, um, you know, they'd have had, people bringing in all of their equipment. So he had like the Duke of Clarence carrying, you know, hel- you know, helmets and all things like, you know, all of the, the gear that they'd need for this. It's one massive spectacle, really, as well as about, you know, you, using your military skills for, for practice, really. So it's it's two things at once that you're basically looking fabulous and you're also trying to kick the crap out of each other. It's one of those... You know, as you as you do. <laughs> I think the only time I remember seeing anything like that on TV was a "Please do not judge me," is a Ninth Tale. With no, uh, I do not judge you because, funnily enough, when I've organised my powerpoints for talks, I've actually got a clip of that because actually, even though. Um, as most people probably guess, it's not necessarily historically accurate film because it's not trying to be. But actually, the jousting setup is a hundred percent accurate. Oh, That's really? pretty much how it would be um, set up in terms of you would have similar things like a bandstand kind of, you know, tiered seating for the rich people, um, you know, and you you need to have all of that kind of thing going on. But you'd also just have. You know, you'd be paying people would be paying to just stand up and watch this. So actually, Night of Tales view of it is quite quite good, I think. I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch it tonight. That's what I'm gonna do. Thank you yeah. for that. <laughs> you mentioned uh Burgundy. Is that what his links are to the region through this specific match? And so that's one of the that's one of the links because as I said, the guy that he's fighting is um, the illegitimate son of the Duke of Burgundy. Uh, he actually was him and his father Richard were put on in charge of the, the marriage negotiations for, for Margaret of York to Charles the Bold, um, which kind of like I said, um, the tournament was an offshoot because the tournament was organised two years before when the marriage negotiations were going off. Um, but uh, Antoine, the bastard of Burgundy, was actually busy um, fighting elsewhere, so they'd had to wait two years until his schedule had cleared up. <laughs> um, you hold on, hold on. <clears throat> ah, did you just say, I'm sorry, I'm busy fighting, put my marriage on hold? Uh, yeah, no, well, the, not the marriage itself. Um, it was like just the tournament that was fought on behalf of England and Burgundy. Oh, that makes more sense. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I've completely cut you off there. What were the rest of them? All right. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the main one. So obviously at that point, like I said, he's organised the marriage between Margaret of, of York and Charles of Old, which had already happened by the time of the tournament. Um, but um, that's only one small part of it, really. Um, so obviously he's had to travel out there and be a diplomat, and um, he would have had to have been very good at languages, to be able to do that um, as well. Um, but at this point, a lot of Europe, uh, the courts of Europe and everything spoke a lot of French. Um, so obviously, you know, that's the main language that people are using rather than, the, um, you know, the, be- the basic languages when they're, you know, doing diplomatic things. So um, he goes over and does that, you know, organises that. And obviously that's successful as you know, Margaret and Charles do do get married. But when Edward IV is exiled, when Henry VI briefly comes back to the throne in 1470, um, Anthony goes out, is one of the group that goes out with Edward into exile, including um, Richard Duke of Gloucester and some others close circle of of Edward IV. So um, he actually goes into exile in Burgundy as well. Um, So that's another big connection as they end up, they first because they all went in different ships to start off with. Um, so they all ended up being blown uh, across different places, but they all ended up being um, staying in Burgundy in, because obviously they built up this alliance through the through the, the Yorkist marriage um, that means that they have got a safe space 
to live whilst they're in exile and they all end up staying um, with a guy called Louis, the Lord of Grethuse, who is kind of, I suppose, um, it's kind of a representative of the Duke in, you know, in the areas that he lives. Um, so he goes and lives, they all go and, and live with him in Bruges. And he was actually famous for possibly having um, Europe's biggest library at that point. Um, so, yeah, yeah, considering this is a point where majority of books are still being produced through illuminated manuscripts as you're only just starting to get the printing press coming in, you know, you can you can just imagine how much money he's ended up paying for the majority of that that library. Um, so he is quite an important important person, really, and I think probably the right person to have gone to for, for help, really, at that point. Um, so it's either through the marriage of Margaret of Burgundy um, to Charles the Bold, um, because Anthony did go out with the marriage. He was the head of the, the marriage party, so he was, the, you know, there making sure that Margaret got to Burgundy okay, got married, you know, all, all done, sealed, all that stuff. So it's either during that journey or when they're in exile um, that we think that he's also become friendly with William Caxton, who was the printer who bought the printing press um, to England in the first place. Um, because around this point, just before he becomes a printer, so at the time of um, Margaret's marriage to Charles the Bold, that's when he was actually uh, an English merchant out in Burgundy. So he was actually the head of the merchant community in Bruges. So there's one or other of those instances is probably how Anthony Woodville and William Caxton met as well. So there's lots of little tidbits going off between him and Burgundy, really. He's, you've mentioned already this, that he was a man that had to know languages. He was well-educated. So he's not just a soldier, but he is a, I'm trying to find the right way of saying this, he's much more than just a man on a horse or a man with a sword. He's also a man of letters, isn't he? Yes, he is. So as I slightly mentioned there is, um, the other way that people might have heard of Anthony Woodville is the fact that he was um, William Caxton's first English patron. So William Caxton, um, like I said, he was an English merchant out in out in Burgundy. He'd kind of seen that that's, Europe is starting to adopt the printing press as a new invention. Um, that doesn't mean that illuminated manuscripts go out of fashion instantly. They actually ended up at this point working alongside each other. Um, and William Caxton was like, right, I'm getting in on this and went and trained to be, you know, working the printing press. And he actually did that in Burgundy for a bit but with under the patronage of uh, Margaret of Burgundy. Um, but at some point um, he became involved with Anthony Woodville and we think it's that relationship that brought William Caxton to bringing his printing press and his printing shop to Westminster. Um, and Anthony Woodville actually was not just his patron, um, he actually helped him to translate texts because that's what Caxton um, was quite famous for was not only was he printing texts, he actually was, because um, obviously at this point, he not, I'd say it's the start of the Renaissance because you start to get the idea of texts and other things being translated into everybody's, you know, into English, French, or, you know, whatever kind of or language that you 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 want, rather than either the Latin or the Greek, which is what kind of went before, really. Um, and Anthony's quite a large part in that, as in, he we know that he translated at least three, maybe four texts um, for William Caxton, and then Caxton then went on to produce them. Um, and the main one that everybody kind of sort of knows is um, called the Dixon Sayings of the Philosophers. So it's basically, uh, so it's translated from a French text that it was actually given while he was on pilgrimage in in Spain. Um, and it's basically just sayings and repetitions and all sorts of moral things that were created by the ancient philosophers, um, particularly, you know, Aristotle, Socrates, things like that. Um, so that's the main one that people kind of, um, might be aware of as that's actually the first printed book 
that was printed in England with a definite date and place of publication. Um, so it's quite important really and it's also the illuminated manuscript version it's the only um contemporary image that we actually have of anthony woodville he's um he's trade um handing this book over to edward the fourth um in the illuminated version as well i love this he's actually a very influential person and i don't know why we don't know more about him this is it because you like i said you kind of i think it's mainly that people have gone well he's not whilst he is kind of you know, a military man as well, is not kind of like Edward IV and it's only a, the military stuff that he's interested in sort of thing. Um, so actually, he's more in the background stuff, but in that respect, actually, he's more important because he's actually helping to shape the culture that is that we now very much associate with this late 15th, early 16th century, um, you know, in terms of what's that's doing to, you know, bringing the printing press over and um, kind of, he's really kind of thinking, right, what what is it that we need to kind of, um, I think um, I've heard it said before that Edward IV was trying to create a replica of, Arthur, you know, Arthur's Camelot. And I kind of think, well, actually, if you think about what on earth is Arthur's Camelot, whilst, of course, there is military side of it and you know in the knights of the round table you also think like of people like merlin and then everybody who are kind of shaping the culture behind it so i think in that respect in a way you could say that um anthony is uh, you know, he's edward smerlin <laughs> you know he's behind like behind that. the scenes working yeah i like that that's actually a really nice analogy i'm going to use that from now on thank you for that yeah. one <laughs> But he is also, so let me start that again. So he comes out of exile, obviously, with Edward. And then he is given, well, an important role. Probably this is one of the most important roles for him, isn't it? And that is becoming governor to his nephew, Edward, Prince of Wales. Yes. So um, Prince Edward, he was born whilst Edward was out in exile, which is also explains why it's called Edward. And like I said, everybody seems to like naming their children after each other. Um, so that's kind of what's going on, really, that um, when he does return back from exile, Edward IV, and regains the throne, it's now safe to think, right, OK, have we saved the Yorkist dynasty again? You know, have we saved it for future generations? And obviously now that he has the heir, which he's been waiting quite a while for, but, you know, he's here now. Um, he was born, actually, in incarceration you know Elizabeth Woodville was um in Westminster you know in sanctuary and that's that's where um Prince Edward was born so it's now a case of right okay the throne's hopefully safe and it pretty much was until until Edward died compared to the first half of his reign that was very much fueled by rebellions um so it's very much about now okay we have the air we've got to do what we can to secure the Yorkist dynasty for future generations and obviously um they have to think right how what we're going to do now with this young prince you know we've got to turn him into a king um so really the whole point was there was a council to look after him to start off with that's how it first started to work with people like um, Elizabeth Woodville Richard Duke of Gloucester, Anthony on board, and some other people who are, you know, quite close to the Yorkish regime to make sure everything's going smoothly. Um, and that kind of runs for a good few years until it's decided, OK, he's old enough now, what are we going to start doing? So he's actually moved to, to Ludlow in Shropshire, which is in the Welsh, Welsh marches, um, to kind of see out his education, I suppose, really. Um, so really for a young, very young child, that must have been very confusing, really, that he suddenly moved out of from his family um, to go and live in the middle of nowhere, really. <laughs> Although um, Ludlow was a Yorkist stronghold before, um, as it, it came down from, from Edward's ancestors um, to him. Um, so it, it was seen as a safe space to let this this young king grow up. 
And it was basically Anthony's role as governor of the head, you know, the governor or the head of um, Prince Edward's household to look after him in every respect, really. So um, he's kind of given a list of quite a long list of rules by King Edward to say, right, this is what I want to happen. And um, I find it really quite ironic that a lot of the the rules are like, oh, yeah, make sure he does his studies and he's got to still have his exercise and he's got to be uh, pious and this, that and the other. And you're like, I can now see why he kind of wanted somebody else to look after him, because a lot of those things are not things that Edward IV is, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, so it, Edward IV is, you know, well known for being an eater, a drinker and a womanizer. So it's quite obvious that he's really, you know, he, he whilst he was... Grown, growing up as the son of a duke himself, he would not have necessarily had the education needed for a king. Um, would so he's to be a king. My God, all the formalities and all of this—it's like you're a puppet on a string. Yes. Yeah, so that's the whole point of Prince Edward's education: is to kind of fit him up for politics, religion, um, diplomacy. You know, everything imaginable that a renaissance king should be um like we said that we kind of imagine the whole idea of renaissance kings and princes being a good mixture of um pious you know physically able you know military skills you know as well as being an educated well-rounded person and that's kind of the idea of what's going on in Ludlow that it should be a mixture of of all of those things. And actually, um, the whole idea is perhaps Anthony has been chosen because he's the guy that fits all of those things best, really. I mean, he was close, of course, obviously, to Edward IV as his brother-in-law, but I think Edward kind of mentions, well, he's he's a right, trustworthy person, you know, as well as being my well-beloved brother-in-law. So it's kind of like, well, actually, we think Anthony's probably the best person to be Prince Edward's role model. Um, and he's the only person that's specifically named in those that list of um, of instructions that should pretty much all, almost always be around the prince. So I think that says a lot possibly about what is thought of Anthony's character. You're giving all of these positive vibes about Anthony, but his his ending's not so positive, is it? No, I'll be honest. No, definitely not. <laughs> Let's talk about his fall from grace and what happens to him in the end, because I, I I'm hyped up with how cool and okay. amazing and smart yeah, and how incredibly influential this man is. Yet you're going to ruin it all for me, aren't you? I wish I didn't have to, I'll be honest. <laughs> Go for it, ruin it. Kill the rose-tinted glasses. Okay. Well, um, so obviously, as I've said, that really not only is he been the main person in Prince Edward's life, he's pretty much the father figure, really, more than Edward IV was, because obviously living in Ludlow, it's kind of a nice little bubble and away from other things. Um Sadly, in April of 1483, Edward IV died only in his 40s. Um, so that meant that the person who is now king, um, Prince Edward of Wales, uh, Prince of Wales, has now become Edward V, aged just 12. Um, and from history, we can kind of see that having a boy king is not a good idea. It causes a lot of friction, a lot of fighting, a lot of wars. And that's basically what started the Wars of the Roses was the fact that Henry VI had come you know, come to the throne as a baby and had been able to be manipulated and, you know, it caused a lot of friction and basically resulted in the Wars of the Roses. So everybody would have been acutely aware of what this meant because not only have you got, like I said, Henry VI within living memory, um, you've also got people like Richard II who also came to the throne as a child, didn't really work out. Um, so, you, you know, you've got this struggle of what, how is the how is the country going to be governed under under a twelve year old boy? Um, because he's not quite yet old enough to rule himself, so he is going to need some help. But how are you going to stop people abusing that position? Um, so 
this is where now 1483 the events of spring 1483 are probably some of the most controversial things of what happened and most contentious as to what actually did and didn't happen um so i'll try and put it as simply as what i think happened during during that time um so um it helped really that obviously Anthony was still at Ludlow. That meant that there was some person of, you know, quite responsible standing with the prince at that point. But you have a Richard Duke of Gloucester, who is Edward IV's youngest brother. Um, he has been possibly named as the Lord Protector. But there is also discussion at this point um, of should should it be one person who's in charge or should there be a council? that helps run things behind behind the scenes whilst the young prince you know the young king is too too young to rule in his own his own right um so there's that all this kind of political discussions going on behind the scenes but whilst all that's going on you know there is a date set for the coronation um and they have to get to london for the date of the coronation and actually whilst um, they found out in ludlow on the 14th of april um, that, you know, the young Prince Edward is now king. It takes them until the 24th to actually leave Ludlow. Um, so you can't, there has been a lot of thing of, well, why would it take them so long, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the main idea that's portrayed is that um, the 23rd is actually St. George's Day. And in those days, St. Days and uh, quite a big thing to, to mark. So it's thought that, you know, that they wanted to to mark that occasion. So where does where does Anthony fall into all of this? Well, so like I said, the whole the whole point now is you kind of sort of have two camps starting to form. So you have the ones that possibly want to stick with um, Richard Duke of Gloucester and try and promote him as the person to be in charge. Or you have the people that think possibly the Woodvilles as a family want to kind of be the people running the show. Um, and I must admit, I think that Anthony necessarily, because um, we're all seeing at this point that the Woodvilles are really seriously scheming to get behind the throne. And really, I've not seen any evidence that Anthony was actually a part of that. Um, so I kind of... He actually was also... Like I said, he had been in exile with uh, Richard Duke of Gloucester when um, Edward the Fourth Circle were in exile, so they actually knew each other and quite well. And only a few months prior to Edward the Fourth's death, he, um, Anthony had actually asked Richard to help him in a legal matter. So I think really he was kind of caught in the middle, really. As in, I think he understood that obviously he's you know this this nephew, but who is also you know part Woodville. Uh, as well and that also you know well if Edward the fourth really did ask for Richard to become Lord Protector you know maybe that's a good idea but by the sounds of it I think if there had been a council um in charge rather than just one single person that actually Anthony would have been perfectly accepted on that council because you know he's a person that's already been with Prince Edward for pretty much the majority of his life He's going to be someone that he can trust, somebody that already kind of knows, you know, the systems that had already been in been in place. So I think really he could have possibly been on a council, um, so quite quite or you know without any problems. But I think in that respect, that's what made him get caught in the middle because he's kind of between these two camps, really. Um, so what happens is obviously they leave Ludlow, they. Uh, make their way to London, but it's agreed that they should meet Richard Duke of Gloucester on en route. Um, and there's discussions about, okay, right, well, obviously you need an armed guard to look after the young king. How many men are you going to have? So the compromise was that um, we think around 2,000 men um, were used to escort um, the, young, the young king. Um, and... By the looks of it, Anthony had no qualms about saying, OK, yep, 2,000 people is enough. So you kind of think, well, if he was involved in any possible Woodville plot that is, you know, possibly people have heard of that was happening at this point, surely he'd be like, no, I need more more men than that. So there's lots of 
this is like I said, when you start to get, there's a lot of questions raised and I don't think 100% possibly things can ever be totally answered as to what happened. Um, but they they did meet up with um, Richard Duke of Gloucester en route. They um, agreed Northampton um, yeah, as it was on the route to London. And um, Richard was coming from his lands in the north, which is mostly where he'd, he'd stayed out, out of the way of things as well. So actually, in that respect, he was a similar character to Anthony Woodville as well, as in they weren't necessarily that bothered at that point to be right in the centre of things, but all of a sudden they they you know they are shoved into it, whether they like it or not, through who had the, the forced death. Um so they meet at Northampton. Um but um it all gets a bit confusing at this point as the excuse that's apparently given is well we can't stay at Northampton, even though it's quite a big town um in that in that period, because it was quite famous for and it still is for shoemaking and things like that. So it's quite you know, a big, a big provincial town. Um, but they say, well, we haven't got enough space to stay in Northampton, which obviously you kind of think, well, um, you know, it's a big place. I'm sure they've got lots of inns to put people up and things like that. Um, so the the story goes that apparently they moved to Stony Stratford, which is actually quite a small place outside of Northampton, which utterly confuses me, if I'm honest, <laughs> when really the theory that's putting put forward by Annette Carson, which I think makes a load of sense, is the Woodville's main house of Grafton Regis is actually not that far from Northampton itself. So maybe the th- possible threat that was seen at this point is they were keeping him safe in Grafton Regis uh, because this is, you know, it's their own private house. They can keep him safe and he's sort of on Woodville territory, which might, I can understand why that might look a bit dodgy, if I'm honest, to other people. But actually, Anthony met with uh, Richard Duke of Gloucester himself. He actually stayed in Northampton to meet with Richard Duke of Gloucester. And they met completely on friendly terms. They had dinner, you know, literally like if you were meeting your best mate, although they weren't quite on best mate level, but, you know, at a pub or whatever. They, you know, they actually sat and had dinner together. Perfectly acceptable. There are some some sources that claim it, but that... Um, Richard Gray, one of um, Anthony's ne- uh, nephews from Elizabeth Woodville's first marriage, was there as well. Um, so, but again, all getting on perfectly all right until the morning after. And suddenly, Anthony, Richard Gray, and Thomas Vaughan, who was also in the Ludlow household, they were all suddenly arrested, saying that there was a treasonous plot going off. Uh, and what I find personally very telling is that actually the only thing that I can see that changed from that evening where they were sat down having dinner in the morning is that the Duke of Buckingham arrived and was having private conversations with Richard Duke of Gloucester and um, the Duke of Buckingham actually did not like the Woodvilles at all he he got quite a lot of um, beef with them shall we shall we say um, over the you know the past few years because he'd been um, he'd actually been forced to marry a Woodville and he said it was below him so that you know, there's lots of other things going off as well. Um, and Lord Hastings, who was actually Edward the Fourth's best friend, who um, was Lord Chamberlain, and did all sorts of things with him with Edward the Fourth, including all his womanizing and everything. He also didn't like the Woodvilles because uh, either, um, partly because I assume there was a lot of discussion about um, his and Edward the Fourth's behaviour. Um, so I think there's a lot of other things going off behind the scenes that possibly this being said that's being said is it true is it not and it's a time when everybody must be utterly scared as to what's going off and it's like who and what do you believe so there's a lot of a lot of that going off so basically like I said those three men including Anthony are arrested and they are placed into different places in in the north um, mainly places connected to Richard Duke of Gloucester. So Anthony himself is first put up in Sheriff Hutton, um, and then eventually. Um, but that's in that is in April. It's a, it takes until June for for them to be um, decided that they are going to be executed. Which again, if they were seriously involved with anything, I'd have thought that they would probably get you know head chopped off straight away. Um, so to me, I think really, from what I've seen, that 
it's more likely that other Woodvilles were involved. And because Anthony was the one that they could get hold of, he was scapegoated for that's other people's behaviour. Yes, so personally, that's what I think happened. Um, that Because like I said, I found no evidence that definitively says he was involved in anything treasonous. What a horrible downfall to an incredible human being. I mm. just... I was hoping that you weren't going to tell me that they were executed and he was sent off into exile, but you, you just, yeah, you broke me. Yes, I think the worst part of it is, so like I said, you know, they had, they take a few months to make that decision um, and then, you know, they are, they are actually executed at Pontefract Castle one after the other on the 25th of June, 1483. And um, he actually writes a poem um, that he's actually written after he's found out he will be executed. Um, and it's basically a, um, a poem about how the Wheel of Fortune continuously turns and not necessarily in the way that you want it to. And I think that actually the way that he's written it is he's not blaming anybody. It's almost like he's completely resigned to that's what's going to happen. And we also know that he definitely did write a will whilst he was... Um, incarcerated as well but obviously as he was executed for treason we don't know whether any of that was ever abided by either so there's all sorts of things going off but um he's actually his execution is actually famous because um he actually died wearing a hair shirt so that's basically like a um a really scratchy vest so kind of like what you think john the baptist would wear um he was actually executed wearing that and um we don't actually know what happened to their bodies either. It, there's quite conflicting <laughs> sources. So most people seem to think that they possibly were buried in a mass grave together. Um, but as far as I know at the moment, no grave site with the headings has been found anywhere within Pontefract Castle. So again, if that is what's happened, the you know, whereabouts would they have been buried? Because it's not necessarily said said where. Um and um Actually, the weirdest thing is that Richard, there is actually evidence that Richard Duke of Gloucester paid for a burial for Richard Gray, who was Anthony's nephew, who was executed as well. And that Thomas Vaughan's body, at least a memorial, is in is up for him um, in Westminster Abbey, if not his body. So it is all sorts of confusingness, even oh, to the wow. end. Um, I've got to say, this has been such an enlightening an interesting podcast to talk about and I really hope people go out and buy your book because this has been great and I am sitting on the edge of my seat and we didn't get through all the questions because there are no, few left but, yeah. but people need to go out and buy the book because then they can find out all those unanswered questions that are still lingering above me uh Danielle remind us the name of your book Yep, so it's Anthony Woodville, Sophisticate or Schema. So it kind of does what it says on the tin. It hopefully tries to answer that question. Was he a Sophisticate or was he a Schema? I'm going to go for Sophisticate, but that's that. I'm, I might be a little bit biased right now. No, because that's that's kind of what I've come up with. So oh, that's there fine. we go. We're on the same wavelength here. It's been really great having you on, though. We'll get this into our bookshop. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book